Hello, and welcome back to, uh, I don't know, the third episode, let's call it episode, of uh, Learning Guitar, and I hope you're doing okay. Uh, this is the uh, second week of lockdown over here. Uh, I don't know you guys, I'm sure most of you are indoors at the moment, so within the limitation of this uh, difficult situation, I hope you guys are doing okay, and uh, hopefully like playing some guitar and learning some guitar is gonna help to ease a bit, you know. The stress and anxiety that goes with all that is going on at the moment. Anyway, let's get into it. In the first two lessons we looked at uh, what I call shape of E, or some people call shape 1. What I mean by this is this particular shape here. Um, in this case I'm playing an A major, obviously. We call it shape of E because it derives from E major with an imaginary barre. And of course, because the guitar is a transposing instrument, we can derive all other keys out of transposing it. Uh, in the first lesson, we looked at a uh, scale that goes with it. In particular, we look at the Ionian. Some people call it a major scale. The, the proper name would be Ionian. And it looks like this. While in the second lesson we looked at all the arpeggios, they went with it. So. Now finally we are kind of closing the circle by discussing chords. Uh, more than once I mentioned the fact that I see uh, arpeggios and scales and chords as three sides of the same coin. So if we are the rhythmic player, more likely we will be playing the chord, more likely surely we'll be playing the chords, or some forms of it. While if we are the soloist, we might be using combination of scales and uh, arpeggios in order to develop melodic ideas. Uh, funny enough, talking about chords is somehow more complicated to elaborate uh, than discussing scalar arpeggios, at least for me, in terms of discussion. Uh, the reason I say that starts from what the actual limitations of guitar itself are. Um, so let's look into them, let's discuss a little bit the relation in between guitar and chords before we look into the actual theory and then some practice. Um, first of all, on the guitar it's difficult to play so-called cluster chords. By that I mean a chord with an interval of one, two, and three, which on a piano it would be incredibly easy to do. While on a guitar, say in the key of C, we would end up with something like this to try and play some, you know, such a like a chord, and it's rather stretchy and rather painful, I would say. Now, for those of you that saw the second lesson uh, where we discussed arpeggios and the vertical stretcher, we know that. Um, a vertical structure for an Ionian mode is composed by seven notes, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13. But we actually only have six strings on the guitar, which means that at any given time, if we play completely, if we fill in all the strings on the guitar, we can only execute six notes, not seven. Again, a piano player has got ten fingers and can possibly do that. We cannot do that. And that's another, let's say, limitation on the guitar. Uh, another one is the way we name chords. What I mean by that is, uh, when we looked at our pages, we kind of defined the way we name a chord uh, and the differences in between, say, a G major 9 and a G major other 9. Once again, if you don't know what I'm talking about right, right now, please go back to lesson 2 and look at the theory section. Um, and by the way, uh, I added index to the videos so you can skip directly to parts and it's in the it's in the um, video description. Uh, so in terms of naming the chords, the fact that from a lot of chords we actually tend to omit some of the notes for reason of comfort. As I say, clusters are very hard, and our guitar chords beside big one tend to be tend to be made by three notes at a time four notes at a time sometimes five notes at a time which which means we're always skipping some of the intervals and when we look at the theory I'll show you generally what goes goes away first let's put it that way and 
So I'm going to show you also how you can name chords even when it's rather difficult to actually give it a give it a proper name. Um, one one other reason for this is the fact that we move in shapes, as a matter of fact, and unless we look at the guitar and the way that we construct chords from the root, as in having a well in mind, where is our ton tonic? Actually, I'll give you an example. It's much easier to understand if I give you an example than try to explain it. Let's look at this chord. This is in this particular key, because that's my root note, and also this is a root note. This would be a B flat major seven. But the only reason I can call this a B flat major seven is because I'm considering this my root note, my number one. So this is one, this is three, this is five, and this is seven. And we looked at this when we looked at our pages. And this is executed as a chord. But if my root note was this one, Okay, now this actually would be a G minor 9. And if my root note was this one, now this would be uh, a D minor with a sharp 5 in the bass. So on guitar, we often come across um, shapes which are exactly the same. And the name of the chord derives from what we actually consider the number one, the root note. And so as you can see, as you will see in the PDF, I like with the scales, I tend to see chords from the intervals, not just as dots. Um, before we move on, what is it that we consider a chord? Well, a chord is three notes, at least three notes, played simultaneously on the guitar. Not two. This is considered a, a, what we call a double stop. The reason being that this particular two notes combined can belong to several chords, okay? Three notes start to be a basic for the definition of a chord. And uh, there are several studies that have been done, some, some incredibly detailed, and I suggest you look into it. I'm gonna put some links to a various artists which kind of push the boundaries of the understanding of chords on the guitar, in my opinion. I mean, I'm sure there is many, many more than the ones I'm thinking of, but these are the ones that kind of influenced me uh, in this discussion. Of course, uh, Joe Pass, uh, uh, Alan Oshworth, obviously, is another one which is very important in the discussion, and Ted Green. Again, I'm sure you know many more. Uh, these are the ones that comes to mind. And not surprisingly, especially in the case of Oswald and Joe Pass, they tend to think in terms, like I do by the way, yeah? they tend to think in terms of major sounds. So chords are, I have a major chord and I have a bunch of sounds, major sounds that I can apply to it. Um, and if you look at it from a logical point of view, you'll see it actually is much easier than you think to develop a lot of chords uh, out of just this simple shape. And I basically wrote what I think is three pages of it. And I didn't even get through all that I could think. And to me, to me, to me it kind of made no sense to even do that. Um, as I said, once you understand the logic of it, you can construct your own chords. It's not that difficult. But from personal experience, from real life experience, I tend to divide uh, chords in the shape depending on two uh, real life situation that I encountered in my life. One is you are in a band, so there is a bass player. Uh, so if uh, if we think of chords like uh, three notes put together, then the bass player more likely is playing the root note, which means that even if I play just two chords, two notes, my two notes plus is root note combined, that is a chord which allows us to create more nicer shapes, nicer sounds, because we're not playing too many notes at the same time. And that, from, uh, from the point of view of arranging or, or, and orchestrating, becomes even more important when there is two guitar players in the band, so that the two guitar players are not kind of repeating each other or overlapping each other. 
So there are chords which I consider shapes, which I think of it as uh, rootless. What I mean is rootless. Oh, interesting. <laughs> what I mean, say for example, in the key of A, this particular shape doesn't have the bass. And this is the kind of shape that I would use, and I should use a lot, when there is a bass player. Okay? So the tonic is well, the, the interval number one is well defined by the bass player itself. Um, different instead is for all those gigs where you're working maybe just a guitar and a singer or a guitar and a brass. Anyway, the guitar is carrying not only uh, harmonic duty, so playing chords, but somehow also highlighting the root. So a whole bunch of chords that actually contain the root itself at all times. So. is always there. Uh, so as you will see in the PDF, there is a bunch of chords that contains the root and a bunch of chords that don't contain the root, although I still highlighted it in order for you to have a visual reference anyway. By now, for those of you that followed the other two lessons, you know how much I think that uh, photographic memory is important. So even if I don't play it, I still want to see that that's, that's the root we're talking about. Uh, for this particular lesson, we're going to look, of course, at the theory of it, as usual. Then we're going to look at the way we can practice chords. And then I'm going to show you some playing. In this case, the playing might be longer, because at this point we close the circle. So I might show you the way I will practice all of it together. Okay, let's look at the theory. So, in order to understand the, the theory of chords, first of all, let's go back to something we already discussed uh, in the first lesson, which was kind of subdividing a little bit um, the chords into families and the kind of interval that needs to be contained for, for a chord to be called, you know, a major, a minor, a dominant seven, and so forth and so on. So I divided the family of chords in major, minor, dominant seven, there is a square here because these are basically the family of chords that we use the most when it comes to pop music, rock music. And of course, as we move more towards maybe jazz or orchestral music, uh, you know, music for movies, uh, etc. Now we also have diminished, augmented, and sustained chords also added to the, to the, to the, to the mix. Um, don't forget, you can always pause the video and copy these kind of things if you want to have your own charts. I also created the same, let me see if I can zoom it properly into it, the same with regards to a standard families. And uh, by that, what I mean is um, the addition of the dominant seventh. The reason I did that is because if you look at major and dominant seven until the triad, 135, 135, it is actually the same. Uh, what differentiates them is eventually the presence of a major 7 while, uh, versus a uh, flat 7, while for minor is 1, flat 3, 5, flat 7. And of course all the other family of chords, half uh, diminished, half diminished, amended and sustained. Why were, are we discussing this again? Because as, we say the, as I said in the introduction, um, the guitar has got some limitation in terms of the number of notes we can play simultaneously. So it's not unusual that we have to omit some of the, some of the intervals from the chord in order for us to be able to perform it. Um, given the commonalities in between, say, for example, major, minor, and dominant seven, it's not unusual that, of course, if there is a bass player in the band, the root note can go, because it's not going to be what defines the chord. Um, the fifth could go for the same reason. The third, not really, because in between a flat three and a three, that's what's going to tell us is a major or is a minor. It's also true in my case that I like to approach it slightly differently in terms that I extract intervals from the actual scales. So as you will see from the PDF, you might have chords, so a group of three notes, which might have as interval one, six, and nine. And if you see, for example, 1, 6, and 9 in this contest, well, 1, 6, 9 can be applied to this family, can be applied to this family, and can be applied to this family, which means that that kind of forms and some of the 
forms and shapes that you will learn from DPDF can be used in a major contest, can be used in a minor contest, can be used in several contests. The scale will kind of tell us. And in that sense, the discussion goes towards the approach that maybe Arnold Oshworth had, some of the approach that Joe Pass had uh, in, in, the, in a way we define courts. I find my approach, and you know, I'm no way near their level of you know proficiency on it, but it's kind of vibrant. It's got some of the Joe Pass approach in it. It's got some of the Ted Green approach to it, but also some of the Arnold Oshworth approach to it. Um, another things that we need to discuss before we look at the practical side is uh, what do we mean by inversions uh, in the PDF. As I'll show you later on, I also detail some inversions. Well, an inversion is simply like the sequencing of how the chord is spelled on the guitar. So if we have a position that literally spells 135, we can invert it in 351, that will be the first inversion, or 513. Um, once you see it on the guitar, it's actually very intuitive. And the theory around inversions becomes very interesting and very practical, actually. Uh, once we have, we have completed the, the five shapes and we are able to move chords across the neck uh, and that will bring us, will give us um, lots of benefits uh, if we're tackling a chord melody, okay? So the kind of things that Martin Taylor would do and uh, once again, Joe Pass, that green, you know. Um, let's have a look at the other part of... So, once again, as we've seen in the second lesson, we looked at the vertical structure, which is this, and what we say that an Ionian chord, or an Ionian arpeggio, contained 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13 as a vertical structure. This is the same as saying 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I think after three lessons, probably like I've been saying this for so, so much that you know, you know it by art. The way I extract chords from it, and that's what you find in the PDF, is literally I'm taking three numbers, three, four, five numbers, to a maximum of six, because we have six strings on the guitar, and to me that is a chord, okay? So one, seven, nine is a chord, one, three, six is a chord, one, three, six, nine, one, seven, nine, three, thirteen, any possible combination. Which means that on the guitar, we have an incredible amount of possible permutations. What I mean is, think about it, we have seven notes, and if we are picking up three, so one, three, five, then three, five, seven, five, seven, nine, seven, nine, eleven, nine, eleven, thirteen, one, three, seven, one, three, nine, one. It's a bit like a pin number. We can, you know, we can create so many combinations, and all those are chords that would apply to that particular scale, so it's a major sound. And in that sense, I think Jopas got it completely right in his book on chords, when he doesn't write the name of the chords. Um, the number of permutation also increases even farther if we start asking ourselves, in terms of right hand, how many strings we are plucking and which one. I could have a chord which uses right hand on the first three strings, then on the middle three strings. Then on the top three strings, maybe four strings, maybe like uh, using finger picking, uh, I can do a bass, maybe the D string and the E string, so forth and so on. So chords becomes uh, um, a fascinating field because of the amount of possibilities. It's a bit like a chess game, where a chess game is kind of limited theoretically because you know the, 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 it's in a square, right? But given the amount of possible moves, feels like uh, infinite. And and in that sense, uh, sometimes to explain chords, it's, it's, it's a little bit harder than it is to, in, in a way, explain arpeggios and explain um, scales. So I hope at this stage I'm not confusing you, let's put it this way. Now, the last problem we need to tackle at the theoretical level is how do we write chords? When we looked at arpeggios, we looked at the difference in between, say, uh, a G major 9, which had an arpeggio which spelled 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and the difference in writing with a, a, a G uh, major added 9, which spelled 1, 3, 5, the triad, 
and the ninth. So he omitted the seventh. When it comes to chords, given the amount of possible permutation, some chords are easy to write on a chart. So if I have a chord that contains one, three, five, and seven, I can simply write C major seven. Uh, that's easy. What happens when a chord, for example, has got one, six, and nine? In that case, is this a major in the first place? Because, as I said, this can be applied to minor, as you, we will see when we do Dorian. Uh, this could be applied to dominant seven, and we can see that when we when we're going to discuss mixolydian. So the the way I tend to write it is literally G and put the intervals. And the only time I would do that is like if I'm writing a chart for somebody else to play, because in this way what I'm telling them is please just play these intervals, okay? So in other words, some chords are very easy to spell, okay? Like in this case just major 7. It's easy to spell uh, a major 6, uh, a major 13, those are the easy ones. But there is a bunch of chords, and you, you see in the PDF, many, which have intervals, which are harder to kind of spell in a chord. So I'd rather do it this way. I'm literally going to write down the intervals. In jazz, uh, as a genre, if you look at the lead sheet or the real book, or in that case, we tend just to write the chord G major, then it's left to the improviser to decide what voicing. You know, we don't have to be that precise. But I would presume that if you write this kind of, if you write music in other genres and you've been creative and you're creating interesting chords, but now you're trying to look for a way to explain to the piano player what you want him to do or to another guitar player, personally I find this way of writing it uh, in parentheses like this with the intervals the most effective. Uh, I'm sure there is a more precise and maybe more academic way to do it. Uh, piano players have an easier life when it comes to this, because they can... they have ten fingers, after all. Um, I hope this kind of explains it. Uh, hopefully I'm not making it more confusing. Uh, bottom line, a chord is three notes all at the same time. Okay? Performed as a right hand arpeggio or as you know as a strummed chord. Uh, the difference in between a chord and an arpeggio is exactly there. The arpeggio is it's a chord but spelled one note at a time in a melodic manner and we saw that in uh, in lesson two. In this case we are playing it simultaneously either as a strum or as a right hand arpeggio or uh, maybe finger picking. Um, two notes is a double stop so it doesn't really qualify as a chord, although you'll see when we discuss power chords later in this lesson, I, I made an exception there. Um, so three notes out of seven is your Ionian chord, Ionian chord. That's the way I see it. Mm, I don't see any other rules. Uh, now let's look at the PDF and let's see what, uh, what you will find there. So here is the PDF I compiled and which you can download from Google Drive. Um, it's three pages. I left, I'll show you later. Um, I left also some blank diagram in case you want to print it out and write your own chords. First of all, you have the big block chord and then a lot of possible permutation and I spell the intervals so you see what you're playing. Um, a bit like in the Joe Pass book, I'd rather not write the name of the chords, feel free to write them yourself, but of course uh, 1357 is a major 7. The problem arises uh, when you have uh, other type of combination which are not so obvious, okay? And they can be applied to several chords, so let's say a 1579. Sure, we would probably spell it in, on a chart as a G major 9 for comfort, but you know, we're omitting the third. So technically this chord could be used as a dominant seven too. So and at the moment I don't want to go too deep into that. But these are major sounds or major forms. And they all adapt to the scale that we studied, uh, the shape that we studied, and the arpeggio that we studied. Uh, some of them I highlighted uh, the possibilities for barre position because it's more comfortable. Others I didn't notate that the fingerings either. You'll find what is more comfortable for you in order to execute it. Uh, these are the inversions. 
So 513, second inversion, 135, just normal, 351, first inversion. Uh, this is actually a double stop, it's a 15, okay? And so, in theory, it would not belong to this discussion, but the reason I'm including it, and I'm including it also using version, is because there is a genre of music like metal rock that uses so-called power chords for composing all the time. So in that context, we actually perceive it as a chord. We don't really perceive it as a just a double stop. Okay. So although, as I said, maybe theoretically not correct, in, I I still think of it as a chord because we use it for writing in the genre. Um, in kind of sequencing this, I didn't, uh, I didn't go for some sort of an exercise. Uh, here I put the, 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 the main triads, okay? This is very used in funky music. Uh, this makes me think of uh, Hendrix and uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, in a way. One thing that I need to point out, as you can see, is there is some white dots. And as you, can, as you will see when we look at the practical side, uh, some of these chords have the root note played, okay? Some of these chords, the root note is not played, and that's where you find the white dot. And uh, I'll show you the other pages, There's, there is more of that. See, for example, this last line. Um, the reason I do that is uh, because I still want a visual of where the root note of the chord is, even if I'm not playing it. Uh, as you will see, I kind of divide chords into two practical situations. The one where there is a bass player, in which case I don't necessarily have to play the root note, okay? And ones where maybe like a duo gig with a singer, where the root note needs to be played in order for, you know, the singer to actually hear the chord. Um, I, if I write it on, with pen and paper, generally I write this in parentheses, not like, uh, so I hope it's not confusing. But when you see a white dot, it means you don't have to play this. But it will help you your photographic memory. So what you're playing for this chord, for example, is actually 3, 7, 9 and 13. Those are the intervals and that's the chord. The one is only there to give you a reference, okay? Uh, as you can see, this is n not written in any particular key. That's whatever you place your root note on the first string of the guitar, that's gonna give the name to the entire chord. Um, at first, the temptation of put them in order of what's most used and what's less used was strong, but then I realized that what's most used in a particular genre is not necessarily used in a different one. So if anything, I try to kind of have close to each other the one which are employing the same set of strings. So maybe this per se could be an exercise, okay? This five here could be an exercise because they are all using the root note and the top three strings, okay? So you can jump from one to another and backwards. Same thing for this line. As you can see, it's like this is group of three notes on the top strings. These guys are on the first four strings. So you can group them in that sense and maybe practicing them going from one to the other, okay? So it's more to do, the sequencing has more, it's got more to do with which strings we're using. So from here to here, as you can see, it's all on the first four strings. Um, <clears throat> this is employing the root note and the middle two strings. So this group over here, and then we go to the root note and three strings, so like uh, this is D, uh, G and B, um, and again, all the way up to here, then you have five strings until like maybe six strings, and then there is a sequence uh, which are without the tonic, okay? So I'll repeat it just for clarity. In this case, only play the black dots. The white dot is only there for reference to tell you where the root node is. It will help you your photographic memory. Okay, and so and I left the, uh, all the intervals so you know exactly the intervals you're playing. But if you've been practicing scales and arpeggios, like I suggest that you do, by now probably you 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 realize that yourself. So we have three pages of possible. These are not all of them. I know you know as I explained to you in the theory, the permutation are so many that. But 
This should definitely give you a very solid foundation. And I left some blank diagrams for you in case you want to print it out and experiment a little bit, okay? I hope this is clear. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at the, the practical side of things. Uh, let me see if there is anything else that I want to add to this. Uh, yeah, one last thing. I mean, this can be played uh, finger-picking styles, right-hand arpeggio if you want. You can try and strum it. Of course, if you try and strum a chord like this, you have to be careful to your music, okay? These two strings, you know, they have to be silent, okay? So um, it could be also a very good exercise for you to develop your right-hand music. Um, for my personal taste, these particular chords, the one which happened on the top three strings, like E, A, and D, to me, they sound better when I arpeggiate them, right hand. Uh, but if it's a clean sound, of course, in distortion, everything changes. So literally, these are not jazz chords. These are not pop chords. This, 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 you know, these are chords. So see which ones you like uh, and, you know, try and see if you can write some music with it. Okay, let's look at the practical side. Okay, when it comes to the practical side of uh, trying to understand and perform chords, um, first of all, we need to understand that different shapes are maybe more common to certain genre of music uh, than others. And as you know, in this discussion about guitar, I like the idea of discussing guitar uh, in general terms, um, independent from what genre you play. Uh, the difficulty I was having when putting together the PDF is was the order in which to actually um, write down some of the shapes that I was thinking of. And the reason for it is that at first I thought I'm going to put them in order of what is most used. But then I quickly realized that uh, what's more used in a certain genre is not necessarily uh, very used in other genres. I'll give you an example. This is uh, um, an A major seven. One, seven, three, five. Okay. Very common in jazz, fusion playing, very common certain types of pop music. I'm thinking of Sting, for example. Not very much common in other genres of music. So does this make this particular form, like Joe Pass will call it, or this particular shape, more important than others? Well, not really. Uh, if we look at uh, one of the inversion of a triad, so this shape, one, three, five, very common in, uh, you know, indie kind of. Um, maybe less common in other genres. This particular triad, again, three, five, one, just an inversion. Very common, you know, mini chords or shell chords, whatever they're called, very much used in funky music, right? So it really depends. And actually, as a, as a matter of fact, on the PDF, you'll see that the second diagram I wrote is actually a power chord, is a 1-5, and I also added the, the second octave of it, because you can play it like this, or you can play it like this. And in a way, now I'm contradicting myself. Uh, in the introduction, I said that a double stop, so two notes, is not a chord. Um, and here I'm suggesting uh, that two notes is actually a chord. But this is also true that in reality, there are genres like uh, uh, heavy metal, rock, you know, thrash metal, you name it. And some of it is actually written with power chords, so we kind of perceive power chords as chords. That's what I call power chords. But ultimately, it just is a double stop, it's a 1 5, right? It's just an interval. But I'm gonna sound corny right now. Um, <clears throat> genre, they, they perceive, they write music using this kind of language, so I, you know, I think it's only respectful if we kind of include at least that concept, 
in the courts, okay? I know that academically is not necessarily correct, but it doesn't matter, really. We're trying to play music. Um, how do we practice courts? Well, there are different ways to do it. And uh, again, uh, you can have a look at the way Ted Green does it in his books or in some of his videos. Of course, there is Joe Pass. Um, uh, you can look at it uh, the way Alan Oshford used to look at it. Uh, and of course, there is always Aldi Mela, which I'm sure I was forgetting. Some of his uh, work, especially the word Symphonia, there is some incredible chord of playing there. Um, Martin Taylor. But at this stage, what we need to what we need to understand is how basically I constructed this chord and I left some diagrams uh, free for you eventually if you want to print the PDF and start writing, you know, your shapes. Um, we can, the way I would do it personally, first of all is to have the usual metronome. I try to have a sequence on the PDF where you have group of strings tackled at the same time. Okay, so you have the first three strings, maybe the, the top and the middle three string, two strings, and so forth. So you can kind of play them as a sequence in a way. But you can even just isolate two, three of them and just keep going back and forth. Okay, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, back and forth so this is by the, by the way is the second line on the PDF okay I know that you cannot follow right now in terms of what it is that I'm doing but it's just to give you an example as I said before this is not gonna be some sort of play along kind of videos but so I'm playing basically the last three notes and keeping the bass on top as I mentioned before to me there are forms that I like to use because they have the bass so say you're comping and it's just you and a singer okay and um, I think Martin Taylor had this approach and I found it very interesting. So the idea is to kind of subdivide the guitar, the strings of the guitar in three parts. Where the first two strings, they kind of cover bass duty. Uh, the middle two strings, they kind of cover harmonic duty. So the bass plus the middle two strings kind of gives you a chord. Because as we say, three notes, that's a chord. And uh, uh, the top two strings might be left you know, in terms of freedom for um, melody, okay? In case you want to do a chord melody. But as I say, like even this, if there is a singer or something, the bass, having the bass will definitely help. Um, another consideration, by the way, on the PDF, I didn't put names, as you've seen during the te in theory, because to me, kind of, for some of them, the names are obvious, for some of them are less obvious, so I found my way, and I was pointing to you in the theory how I, write, I like to write them whenever it gets more complicated. Let me stop the measure one second. And uh, I, I like grouping them. So for example, in this case, I'm gonna use the bass and the top three strings to build chords and just move them around, okay? Some of the permutation that I highlighted uh, in the uh, in the PDF. These are all 
different chords with three notes. And in terms of uh, fingering, some chords kind of force you in a certain direction, especially when it comes to small bar chords, in order to execute them. Uh, again, I didn't put fingerings as such on the PDF for the simple reason, I mean, that there are shapes that can be performed with different type of approaches. Uh, as we're looking for, <clears throat> as we're looking for, uh, stop the measurement, uh, some degree of uh, efficiency in our playing, um, I tend to think, I, tr I tend to try for as much as I can to have uh, fingerings which allow some degree of extra freedom so that from a chord I can move to another chord or add some more colors to it. Let me, let me explain you in, in, in uh, practical terms. Let's look at this shape. Very small kind of shape. It's one major seven and third. So this is a major seven. I think this is called a shell chord. I call it mini chord, whatever, doesn't matter what's the name, you know. Um, if I finger it this way, this finger is still free, okay? That's the idea. So I can add, it's free this side of, you know, this side of the scale. Remember that the scale is this. So I can add that. sense but of course I can also play it with a barret and obtain the same thing with the addition that I have access to these notes too so I can still start from this but I also have access to these four notes and I can build other chords out of it If I play this way, same shape, same form, now I have this finger is free and I have access to notes on this side. So, so I can play this 7, 3, 6, 9, okay? And I can play with that. And I also have access to the major 7. trying to say, and I'm hoping you're understanding it, is <clears throat> so some of these particular shapes will kind of force you to finger it in a certain way, but some others, they might be kind of flexible, and <clears throat> what you're trying to achieve is some degree of, um, how do I say, efficiency, so having eventually some fingers free, if you can, in order to create variations, and in order, especially if you're thinking of playing chord melody later on. But even just, you know, to have motion, you know. Uh, because of this, I tend to agree with Joe Pass' approach and um, in terms of thinking, in terms, in terms of sound. For me, like, okay, this is 6-9, but this could be a minor 6-9, this could be a dominant 6-9. I'm, I'm just thinking, that's my chord, that's what I'm thinking of. But I'm creating all these other sounds. So these are major sounds. Why? Because I'm deriving them from the major scale, from the Ionian in this case. I like this one. Of course, like you can practice with a pick. you can practice plucking using your fingers I mean those are two options and also you can practice as uh, a block or as a right hand arpeggio these are different ways and of course it will be conducive of 
different ideas. Uh, so besides going through all the shapes and kind of moving back and forth in between them, you know, you don't have to practice all of them at the same time, obviously. Um, try and write little things, see what happens. As I mentioned in the theory, I like to divide chords and the way I practice them into the ones in which I'm holding to the root note. In this case, our bass are, is on the first string, shape of E, right? So that's my reference, that's my visual reference. Uh, and they come very handy, especially when there is no bass player in the band. So all those duo kick, right? Like, uh, you want to course a guitar and a vocalist, okay? Uh, where it might be relevant that you also project kind of the bass. But also there is all a bunch of voicings that you can create, a whole bunch of forms that don't have uh, a deep root implied, probably because there is a bass player in the first place. The way I like to practice it in this case, in order for me to be able to hear it, is to have a drone. I'll show you what I mean. So I'm going to play a drone of A. And in the PDF, these are the chords where you have some black dots with number, but also some white dots. And the white dots implies that you're not playing that dot, but it's for your photographic memory. I know I'm repeating myself, but I think it's important. And so some of these chords do have the root, which is here. But because it's in the higher octave, it tends to get a bit more lost in terms of bottom end, right? So you have sounds like this. So the drone, the, 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 having a drone in the bass allows me to hear how they sound because, as I said, don't forget that these are major sounds just because we're using this as a reference, okay? Uh, you might have seen me playing this shape, actually, and it's in the PDF, okay? For those of you, most of you, you can actually recognize a C-sharp minor. This is a C-sharp minor, as a matter of fact. But I'm seeing it in the context of, let's see if I can, in the context of this. Okay, so that's the sound. In that case, because this is the root note, well, this, yeah, it's still a C sharp minor if you want, but to me, that's a major chord. It's a major sound, like three, seven, three, five. Okay? You probably, for those of you, you know, with eagle eyes, you might have spotted this which is an E major, but, okay, that's, it's a major sound, and that's a major chord, because this is my root note, okay? So always, always, always refer your chords to, okay, who, who's the root, who's number one? Based on that, you can figure out this, the rest of the intervals, and I think there was a fantastic book by Joe Pass, I don't know how easy it is to find, to be honest with you, where he discusses chords, and Beside uh, defining them simply as major sound, you'll notice in his book, 
it doesn't give name to the chords. These are just shapes, for, he calls them forms, I think, that he likes to apply to major period, you know. And uh, while if you come across Ted Green books on chords, have, those are masterpieces, by the way. And, you know, I cannot stress enough, I mean, if you want to know more about chords, uh, beside this, right? If you want to go deeper than I possibly can in a lesson like this. Those should be probably some of your references, Ted Green, Joe Pass, um, Martin Taylor, Alan Oshworth, definitely. But the idea is, that's my root note, and that's my scale. All the notes in this scale, I can put three of them together, four of them together, five of them together, and that's a chord, period. I'm just going like, you know, I'm going to take this one, this one, this one, that's a chord. Okay? I'm going to take uh, this one, this one, this one. See what I mean? So I tend to look for the ones where I can also perform the bass, and I might end up using those in a duo gig. But also I might end up, you know, looking for the, the one without, like this, if I'm in a contest where there is a bass player, so there is no need for me to hold down to the root. I hope this helps. Uh, let's look at um, some plank, okay? So, here we go. We are closing the circle at this point in terms of plank. We have done our shape one and we looked at it, shape one, sorry, shape of E. And we looked at it from the point of view of uh, the scale. And uh, hopefully at this point you already practiced enough in terms of intervals, um, group of three, group of four, uh, triads, extended triads and all that. All the stuff that you find in the PDF to lesson one. Then we also looked at all your pages that go with it. And that was lesson two. And now with this we are adding the chord and I guess the cycle is closed. So in this sense, I'm going to show you the way I would actually practice this. Uh, last week, I, last week, last lesson, I added some uh, degree of limitations to your practicing the arpeggios. In this case, we're just going to go free. Um, I'm going to show you how, how I tend to do it. You don't have to do it this way. It's simple, it's simple playing, by the way. So I tend to have a, first a drone and be melodic against it and maybe playing some intervals and whatnot and then i'm going to start practicing some chords against it and then i might loop those chords and and then play some more on top of that in terms of melody um, the limitation obviously i'm only using that shape okay and i tend to do that um, again it's about trying to get the most i can out of it okay before moving to something else it's not, sometimes probably it's not as easy as I think it is, or I, I don't know, I know it's not the easiest thing to try and phrase having little, okay? But at the same time, as I mentioned, you know, the g mole kind of metaphor, uh, sometimes having those, you know, limitations is what makes the exercise interesting, okay? So let's see what happens. I'm going to do it in A this week, okay? Just to change. So that's my shape of E, that's what I am.
make sense uh, as usual I hope uh, I managed to uh, explain you the logic on how to do things and uh, in this case chords try and devise even your own I mean go through the PDF and then see how you can spend hopefully the theory of it uh, I've been clear enough the more I do this the more the meaning of the word teaching is kind of losing its uh, uh, is important. So let's put it that way. I like this idea of discussing guitar with you guys and girls. Um, I don't know how much I can teach you as such, but we'll discuss it and maybe it will inspire you some idea. Hopefully, it will, dis it will inspire you your creativity, and that would be like already a massive achievement. Um, today, I played a little bit more than I generally would in terms of video but, um, I've done some mistakes I don't actually care the, the point is like trying I was trying as much as I could and to get as many ideas out of that particular shape tomorrow I might do the same uh, in a different key again photographic memory muscle memory uh, I'm using words that we developed in the first two lessons in the scales and and in the arpeggios, that's pretty much all there is to it. And I was also trying to use different um, effect pedals in the contest, you know, trying to get different sounds and see what any sounds brings to the to the game. Um, yeah, of course, like if you have any questions about it, something that is not clear, maybe feel free to leave a comment and as usual. If I have the time, uh, uh, I'm more than happy to reply. I gotta thank you for the excellent feedback uh, I got so far out of this. Um, and I'm glad people are appreciating it. Uh, and as I said, if it's useful, it's a nice way to discuss guitar and to discuss what I found out so far about it, you know, in my personal experience of it. Um, next lesson, before we moved to the next shape, which is going to be the shape of D, uh, D major, um, I'm going to do one lesson, probably it's going to be rather short, maybe like it's about what I, what I call creative exercising. So I want to show you a few different ways in which you can create your own exercises and develop your words. So ABC words, phrasing, don't forget that. So far, I think like I come up with a couple of things that seems to make sense to people. The first one is to think of this as three sides of the same coin. So you have a chord, you have an arpeggio, you have a scale. It's all the same thing, just three different point of views. And the, the other one is this idea of having an ABC. So the exercises we're doing in a way, then the words, what we're trying, you know, and dissect any particular subject in as many possible ways we can find and then obviously looking at the um, looking at the 
at the playing side of things, you know. Uh, soon we'll have two shapes that we can start connecting, which means that our ability to move across the neck of the guitar will expand, but one thing at a time. Trying at the moment, for as long as you can, in a way, be patient, and trying to get the most out of this particular shape, okay? Before, you know, let's walk before we run, okay? It's been a pleasure and I hope to see you soon. In the meanwhile, take care and I wish you all the best and be safe, okay? Bye.